Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Temple Baptist Church Sunday School lesson for June 27, 2021. Uh, as you know, we've started a series called The Church That God Desires. And we're looking at the letter uh, that John was writing in the book of Revelation to the churches, the seven churches. And uh, we've already covered four of those churches, and we're going to move on to the, uh, or three of those churches, we're going to move on to the fourth. Uh, the the title of today's lesson is Strong in Purity. We're going to be in Revelation chapter 2, verses 18 through 29. And the point is purity in all things impacts your service for Christ. So as we dive deeper into these messages to the churches, uh, Jesus has already made comments to the church at Ephesus, Smyrna, and Pergamum. Now he will address the fourth, fourth church at uh, Thyatira. So with that being said, let's have a word of prayer. Father, we, we just ask your anointing this morning, God, on your word, Lord, that you would reveal to us uh, just what we need to see, God, as uh, in this letter to the churches, God. We, uh, our heart's desire, God, is to be obedient to you, and we need to understand your instructions, God. So we ask you, Father, by the power of your Holy Spirit, awaken us, just cause us to be alive unto you, and to hear your voice. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. So this, uh, this letter that, uh, or this, this letter that John is writing is actually the longest address to the churches, and it has a little more detail than the other three that we've already reviewed. Um, now, as these churches are within 40 or 50 miles of one another, um, it would seem reasonable that the other churches uh, may be feeling the effect from each other. So, uh, and also, who's to say the problems are not moving from one city to another uh, to infect other churches? Evil never gives up easily. Jesus warned us to stay vigilant, sober, because our adversary, the devil, like a roaring lion, walks about seeking whom he may devour. And if he loses ground in one church, he's, he's going to move to another. Okay, let's take a look at Revelation chapter 2. We'll start in verses 18 and 19. And unto the angel of the church at Thyatira write, These things says the Son of God, who has his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet like unto fine brass. I know your works, and charity, and service, and faith, and patience, and your works, and the last to be more than the first. Now, as we've noticed in other letters, Jesus reveals himself according to the need of the church. So who does the church need to see to bring about the necessary change? Here, Jesus reveals himself as the Son of God, who has eyes like flame of fire and feet like fine brass. Now this doesn't sound like the itinerant preacher who walked the Sea of Galilee. Um, it doesn't sound like the preacher who fed the 5,000 or who gathered children on his lap. This was the Lamb of God, nor does it look like the Lamb of God who was slain for our sins. The picture here is one who has eyes burning through the deception to reveal the truth. The one who has feet of brass, symbolizing he stands on judgment. Brass was always symbolic of judgment. The brazen serpent in the wilderness, the brazen altar before the tabernacle. The first place anyone came if he wanted to approach God in the Old Testament it, uh, was the altar. And it was a place of sacrifice and a place of cleansing. Everything Jesus describes about himself here is one of judgment. The eternal judge of the universe has declared it. He continues to commend the church for five things. Their works, their charity or love, their service, their faith, and their patience. Now, we can look at these, I, I kind of made this up, but you can look at these like the five pillars of the church. Works are those things we do in obedience to Christ as he speaks to us through the Holy Spirit. And uh, I, I want to add works, start at home. If our homes are not in order, then our church will not be in order. Uh, charity or love, this is a different type of love. This is not the kind of love that we share as brothers 
Uh, it's, not the, it's not a sensual love, but it is God's kind of love, agape love, the kind of love that gives without expecting anything in return. Faith. He talks about faith. Faith in God's ability to carry us through, to strengthen us by His Spirit and the Word of God. And finally, patience. Who knows the mind of Christ? We sometimes get impatient waiting on God to do something and we are tempted to move out on our own, to take matters in our own hands, so to speak. Now this is where faith comes in. We must have faith that God knows what He's doing and we need to wait for it. Most of us can relate to that anxious feeling we get when we ask God to do something, but we can't wait for Him to work His plan. We know what He is doing. Uh, He knows what He is doing. Let Him work. Now, Jesus mentions works again. This means the church is making progress, and the works that they're doing now are more than they, di- that they had in the beginning. They are learning to be patient and to let love have its perfect work. Now, let's look at verses 20 through 23. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee, because you, thou sufferest the woman Jezebel, which called herself a prophetess, to teach and to seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. And I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not. And behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. And I will kill her children with death, and all the churches shall know that I am he which searches the reins and hearts. And I will give unto every one of you according to your works. Now, although it seems Jesus was proud of the church, he still had some things against it. You see, the church was tolerating a woman in the church that called herself a prophetess. Now, tolerance is is sometimes a good thing, but there comes a time when we must take a stand against false teachers and false doctrine. Notice this Jezebel called called herself a prophetess. Now, this Jezebel is an interesting character. She was the wife of Ahab in the Old Testament. He was the king of Israel. She was not Jewish, but she was Zidonian. And she led Ahab astray even to the point he built altars to Baal, who was uh, uh, the uh, Canaanite god, and and he, he even killed the priest of God. He set up a false religious sect, angering God. God eventually had to use Elijah to destroy the priest of Baal and bring destruction to Ahab and Jezebel. Let me read you in 1 Kings 16, 30 through 33. And Ahab, the son of Omri, did evil in the sight of the Lord above all that were before him. And it came to pass as if it, had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, that he took to wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Zidonians, and went and served Baal and worshipped him. And he reared up an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he had built in Samaria. And Ahab made a grove, and Ahab did more to provoke the Lord God of Israel to anger than all the kings of Israel that were before him. Now that's a railing accusation against Ahab, and we can see that Jezebel played a huge part in the, uh, the seduction and deception and drawing her husband away to serve other gods. Now this woman that we're talking about in the church of Thyatira, she was not called by God. She called herself a prophetess, but she was not called by God, but she usurped the authority God gave to his called and ordained ministers to lead the church astray. God's word is clear. Women should keep silence in the church and submit firstly to her husband and secondly to the men of God that he has ordained to shepherd the church. Now this woman's doctrine is a doctrine of seduction that teaches, hey, it's okay to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed to idols. Not only is it okay, it's but it's required according to their doctrine. This seduction, as is all seductions, plays on the human desires and emotions. If it feels good, do it. Now, it's important to understand that uh, 
this seduction that was going on in the churches was, was a common practice in the pagan religions surrounding the Christian church. So it's not surprising that these folks were easily led away. It would be probably more difficult in, in our area to lead people astray to eat things offered to idols because we really don't do that physically. We offer things to idols spiritually and we do that maybe emotionally but we don't really do it physically and, and to commit fornication uh, to, to even believe that it's okay to do that but God's grace now this is this this amazes me God's grace is exhibited in the next verse he, he says I gave her space to repent so even with the things that she was doing uh, the people that she was leading astray the false doctrine that she was that she was uh, preaching to the church or in the church, God's continued to extend His grace to her to allow her to repent. But she wouldn't. And, and I found out as I read that, that, you know, that anything can be forgiven if we're willing to repent. Without repentance, judgment comes. Not only for Jezebel, but all those who followed after her. She that used the church will find herself being used. Isn't that the way it goes? Her seduction will backfire and she will reap what she has sown unless she repents, unless they repent, her followers. How can God be so merciful, forgiving those who have so blatantly used the church, the body of the Lord? Even her children will be under judgment. Now, I don't believe he's, these are her natural children, but I think she's, Jesus is speaking spiritually. Those who have followed her false teaching and have taken delight in it. In the next verse, Jesus reveals himself as the judge over the church. He will punish those who will not repent. This will be a sign to the church of who is really in charge. The church will know who searches the deep recesses of the heart. And just like the church of Pergamum, uh, can use a two-edged sword to discern the thoughts and intents of the heart. Jesus knows how to separate those who defame his name and those who are faithful. So let's take a look at verses uh, 24 through 29. But unto you I say, and unto the rest of Thyatira, as many as have not this doctrine, and which have not known the depths of Satan, as they speak, I will put upon you none other burden, but that which you already hold fast till I come. And he that overcomes and keeps my word unto the end, to him will I give power over the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron, as the vessels of a potter shall they be broken in shivers, even as I received of my father. And I will give him the morning star. He that has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says unto the churches. But to the rest is a clear delineation between the faithful and and the faithless, those that have not fallen for the deception and have not known the depths of Satan, he will put no other burden on them. This is the trial by fire. They have already proven themselves by resisting the temptation to follow this false teaching. Hold fast till I come. Hold fast to the faith. Hold fast to the love. Hold fast to the patience. Continue the works. Be overcomers by faith in the risen Christ. In the end, those who have been ridiculed, rejected, subjected, will be given power over the nations. Think about that for a moment. Everyone feels slighted at times. Most Christians have felt demeaned or ridiculed for their faith. But in the end, those who have, uh, who have ridiculed us will be our servants. Those that have the power now will relinqu relinquish this power to us. The day of the Lord is coming. And he, speaking of Jesus, will rule over them with the rod of iron. And I like this phrase, uh, the fact that Jesus having to rule over them. Now, he's talking about specifically 
the days after the tribulation when Jesus is reigning and ruling on the earth in the, for the thousand year millennial reign. But there's still going to be struggles. There's still going to be rebellion. There's still going to be those that will not submit. That's why it says he will rule over them with a rod of iron. They will not give up the power easily. Satan is defeated but will fight until the end before he lets go of his domain. But the good news is Jesus will take it by force. Just like a clay vessel is easily broken, they will be shattered into pieces. Com completely broken and of no use anymore. And he goes on to say, I will give him the morning star in verse 28. Now, Revelation twenty two sixteen. 16, this is what Jesus says. And I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and the offspring of David and the bright and morning star. So when he says, when Jesus is telling John, and I will give him the morning star, Who's he going to give that to? He that overcomes. Who is this morning star? Or what is this morning star? Well, we find out it's not a what, it's a he, and it's Jesus. And we've made this comment before. The true morning star is Jesus. He is our reward. As I said uh, before, our inheritance is not a place, but a person. Jesus. He is our possession. If we have Jesus, we have all we could want or we could need. The question now is, do you have ears to hear? Are you listening to what the Spirit is saying to the churches? Are we willing to learn from these churches in Revelation and apply those learnings to our life and let the Holy Spirit uh, encourage us to continue on with faith and love? and patience, and service, and works. I think the what I want to hear and what I hope you want to hear is when Jesus comes back again, for him to say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. So I'm going to leave you with that this morning. What's Jesus going to tell you when he comes back? What words will he have for you when he returns? Father, we love you, God. We thank you so much for your word, God. We thank you for the, uh, this church, Lord, and the encouraging word. Thank you for showing us, you know, we all have this picture, Jesus, of you being this uh, weak or timid or just this preacher walking around in the desert, Lord, but here we see you as, you know, the judge, the one who who holds everything in his hand. The eyes of fire that can see through everything. The feet of brass that uphold judgment. God, and we know that when you come again, you won't be that guy. You'll be the one riding on the white horse. Now there'll be thousands upon ten thousands behind you, all coming, and you'll be coming in your glory. Lord, and I, I think that's what the church really needs to see now. We need to see that Jesus. We need to look forward. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. The one that's going to come and set up his kingdom. So even so, come Lord Jesus. We pray this in your name. Amen.